Hi guys, welcome back after our half term break. Hope everybody had a nice week off, a bit of refreshment time and hopefully a little bit of time away from our screens as well. Today we're going to be starting a new topic and that topic is going to be looking at rivers and our first lesson is going to be looking at something called the water cycle. Now this term the water cycle you will have heard before perhaps in primary school so a lot of this lesson might be a small refresher but it's really important we understand this cycle before we move on to look at rivers in more detail. As always I'd like to watch this video uh, and you feel free to pause at any point if you feel the need to but at the end there will be three review questions I'd like to answer those three review questions and upload them onto Satchel 1 so I can have a look through your answers to that. So, as I've just said, this half term we're going to be studying rivers. We're going to be looking at lots of rivers around the world. We're going to be looking at how they form, what landforms they produce, and what problems they cause. In particular, uh, we're going to be focusing in on flooding uh, of certain rivers as well. And it's one of my favourite topics because rivers are some of those things that you don't really think about in your everyday life, but they're absolutely vital to human, to human life. If you go to any major city in the world, you can pretty much guarantee there'll be a river running through it somewhere. If you think about Liverpool, we've got the River Mersey. If you think about London, you've got the River Thames. New York, Paris, Berlin, every single city in the world pretty much will be close to a major river resource. And that's really, really important uh, to kind of understand that. But we're going to start off by looking at the physical aspects of just water itself. So before we even get to the river... I think it's important that we understand what is going on in the water and the atmosphere around us. So, a bit of a science recap here. Water can exist in three different states. Okay, We can have our normal liquid water that we all drink. If I put that water in the freezer, it will then become solid ice. And if I boil that water on a stove, it might become water vapour. So water, or H2O, can exist as a solid, a liquid, and a gas. We all know the boiling point of water is 100 degrees, and we all know the, boiling, uh, the freezing point of water is 0 degrees. And understanding that water can change states of matter is really important to understanding how life on our planet actually exists. And so when water changes from a solid to a liquid and back to a solid, or back to a liquid, we call that the water cycle. Okay, so the water cycle is essentially water changing into different states, and we're going to go into more detail with that as we progress with this lesson. And so, you might also, uh, over the last year or two, have seen some of these key terms as well. So, let's say, for example, I've got ice, water, water vapor, and then more water as well. If I have that ice and I melt it, it will go from a solid to a liquid state, so it'll be ice back into our normal liquid water. If I uh, heat it up on a stove and the water evaporates, that becomes water vapour. If it freezes, it becomes ice again, and if it condenses, it goes from a gas to a liquid. And we're going to look at those key terms in a bit more detail as we go along. Uh, but I hope just to pause the video now and spend 30 seconds thinking about those key terms and where else you have come across them in other subjects. Okay, so hopefully uh, words like evaporation, condensation and melting you will have seen across science this year and in primary school as well. And so we're going to focus on kind of three uh, or four key terms today. And they are all to do with the water changing states of matter. And it creates something that we call the water cycle. That's evaporation, transpiration, condensation and precipitation. They are four large big words, but all four of them they're a lot simpler than they make out. They're big words, but they're quite simple concepts, really. And so the idea is, is that this is a cycle. So this is happening over and over and over again. Things like evaporation, condensation, precipitation. I'm going to go through each of those four key terms now, and then I will explain this diagram in more detail when we get to the end of that explanation. 
At any point during this video, if you feel you are a bit unsure about what these key terms mean, just pause it and try and re-listen to it, or you can ask for help at this point as well. So we'll start off with our first word, evaporation. So evaporation is when a water passes from a liquid to a gas. Okay, so if you ever get in a really, really hot shower and you're seeing loads of steam, that is evaporation in practice. The water's not boiling. You're not in that shower literally boiling yourself alive. It's hot and therefore the water is turning into a gas. And this explains how water leaves our planet. Because water that is held in lakes, rivers and the ocean evaporates and changes into a gas and rises up into the atmosphere and that evaporation is a really really important point to understanding the weather but also understanding uh, you know where our water is coming from okay so our water in lakes and rivers evaporates turns into a gas so as a gas it rises because it's less dense and ends up in our atmosphere Water can also leave through the ground and through our plants as well, through a process called transpiration. And essentially, all this is, is it's the same concept, is that at the end of it, there is evaporation from usually a plant surface. But this time, rather than being stored in a lake or river or the ocean, the water might be underground or it might be in the soil. It's absorbed by plants, the water travels up through the plant until eventually it evaporates. And that's why one of the reasons why the rainforest uh, is such a wet area is because of all that evaporation and transpiration leads to more condensation. Okay? Now, condensation is where, okay, we've had transpiration, we've had lots of evaporation. And so all that water vapor, the gaseous state of water, has risen into our atmosphere. However, as it rises, it's going to cool down. And as water vapour cools, it condenses, okay? If you've ever seen uh, like a hot day or even a cold day on your windows and there's like a glaze of like water or it looks quite misty on your window and you wipe it away, you might, you might call that condensation the same idea. So that water vapour cools and condenses to form clouds. So all the clouds in our sky are basically a condensed version of that water vapour. They're not exactly fully liquid yet, but they're not as gaseous as they were before that. And so if there is a lot of evaporation and a lot of transpiration, there would be a lot of clouds in the sky. If there was no evaporation and no transpiration, there would be no clouds in our sky. And that leads on to the final word here, which is precipitation. Now, precipitation is any water that falls from the sky to the Earth's surface. There's a reason I don't call it rain, and that's because if I was in the Arctic or the tundra biome, for example, it would not fall as rain, it would form as snow or sleet or hail. So precipitation is the more scientific word we need to start using, and that's any water at all that falls from the sky to the Earth's surface. And it's that precipitation but then gives us our rivers, okay? gives us our uh, water sources. And so the reason why precipitation happens is because as we have this condensation of the clouds, eventually the clouds get too heavy, the water droplets start to form, and when the cloud gets too heavy, it releases that water as precipitation. And so if you ever see the cloud go quite dark, when the clouds go black or grey, that's showing that they're really, really heavy. And therefore, when you see a black cloud or a grey cloud, chances are that's going to lead to rain. And so let's go back to our diagram then. Let's follow a piece of water. A piece of water, let's follow some H2O. So, we've got our river here, which is leading into the ocean. And let's say we've had some evaporation from the ocean. Okay, that water has evaporated, it is lifted up into the atmosphere. As it is lifted into the atmosphere, it condenses, and as it condenses, it forms clouds. Once those clouds become too heavy, the, the, the water is then released as precipitation, which would then provide the fuel for our river. 
that fuel for the river will then flow and meet the ocean. There'll be more evaporation, condensation and precipitation. Transpiration has a very similar role to evaporation. And so you can see how it's a cycle because it just goes round in a big circle. There's precipitation, rivers, oceans, a bit of, a bit of evaporation, more condensation, more precipitation. And so water is never created or destroyed. It's simply transferred. Um, and so that's why our planet never seems to run out of water. That's why our rivers seem to keep flowing is because this cycle is happening on a large, large scale uh, all around the world. OK, and we call that the water cycle. If you do have a spare five minutes, you can type in the water cycle song onto YouTube. And if you want, you know, the, the worst song you will ever hear in your lives, you will then find it there if you type in the water cycle song. But we're not going to put that on here. So that's the water cycle. Four key terms, evaporation, condensation, transpiration and precipitation. And those four things are what basically enable our rivers to flow, our oceans to form, etc., etc. Without this, if we took out evaporation, we took out precipitation, the water cycle would stop and life on Earth would probably cease to exist as well. So it's quite extreme, uh, but it really explains how our rivers keep flowing and it explains that water can change states uh, as part of the cycle. So, as always, there are three review questions I would like you to answer. So, the first one is, what are the different states of matter water can be held in? The second one, explain what evaporation and condensation mean. And then finally, using the term evaporation, transpiration, condensation and precipitation, explain what is meant by the term the water cycle. And so, that third question, I, I basically want you to explain that diagram. So basically wanting to explain, using those keywords, what, what the water cycle is, and that's what the best answer will be. Uh, if you want to draw your own water cycle on top of your definition, that's fine. But if we're going to do diagrams, remember, uh, I would like to make sure you are providing a written explanation. So I'll rephrase that again. Three questions. The first two are quite straightforward. For the third question... I'm simply asking you to basically explain the water cycle. I personally would use this diagram to help me to explain each step of what's going on. If you feel like you would like to or would help you, you are free to draw a diagram to help you with your answer. But I don't just want you to put a diagram with no right. I want you to write this in your own words. Any questions, as always, uh, please use the Zoom link. But other than that, um, have a good go at this now.